Hey Eagles fans, this is Chris Franklin from NJ Advanced Media, and welcome to the No Huddle Show podcast, the show where we discuss all things related to the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, before we begin, I wanted to remind you that you can read our content on nj.com slash eagles, and make sure to bookmark that to get the latest Eagles news and analysis. Today, I'm once again joined by my No Huddle Show co-host, Bob Rogover and Gaines Steele. Well, we finally had a meaningful Eagles game, and even if it looked like it was more hockey than football with all the players slipping and sliding on the field... Yeah, it was still football, and we got to see what happened with the Eagles. But first off, before we get more into the uh, a little bit into the game and to preview the upcoming game against the Atlanta Falcons, I'm going to bring in Bob and Katie. Guys, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, I don't know if you wanted me to go first or Caden go first, but hey, go it's, first. it's a free it's a free for all today. Why not? You know, everybody in. I, I'm, I'm doing I'm doing great. I couldn't do be doing better. I, if I was doing better, I I don't know what I'd do if I was doing any better. But I'm doing great. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Nice, nice. How you doing, Caden? Yeah, doing good. Uh, we're, look, it, it's crazy, right? We watched the game on Friday. It's already Thursday. This moving, it's, things are moving already to week two. Things are already moving fast. So, but doing great and excited to uh, you know, talk about last week and preview this week. Nice, nice. We're gonna get into it right now. We're gonna start with our opening drive question, and it's gonna focus on the Eagles pass rush. Now, the Eagles won the last Friday night's game in Sao Paulo, Brazil, by a score of thirty-four to twenty-nine. It wasn't clean, as we mentioned previously with the field, but there are also some bright spots defensively. We saw the rise of some players. But one thing that did stand out defensively was the lack of pass rush on the edges. When you look at it, it was pretty much Josh Sweat a little bit. In my opinion, I'll start with this. I'm going to ask you guys about this. It was Josh Sweat providing some pressure. The ageless wonder, it seems like Brandon Graham popped up and he had some good pressures. But overall, there were no sacks by the edge rushers. The only the Eagles finished with two sacks in the game, and they both were by linebacker Zach Bond. So I'm going to start with you, Bob, in terms of this opening drive question. Will the pass rush turn things around and you look better Monday night against the Atlanta Falcons? Yeah, well, here's here's one of the things about the pass rush. I think that maybe we can give them a little bit of a pass on the pass rush. Uh, is that the field, as you mentioned, uh, was as slick as ice. Uh, and it's, you know, definitely not to the defender's advantage when fields are slippery. Uh, and, and it made it hard, it hard to get a footing and maybe to, to pin back to your ears and go after guys. Um, you know, yeah, I thought Josh Sweat played a pretty good game because when I look at a, when I look at how a guy did, I, I take, take into account, like, did he draw a holding? Did he get a tackle for a loss? Josh Sweat drew two holdings, and he had it. And his first, the very first defensive play of the game for the Eagles was him, him for a two-yard tackle for a loss. So I mean, and that simple math, which is the only kind of math I know how to do, that's minus twenty-two yards credited there to to Josh Sweat. Um, didn't have any sacks. Did have some pressures. I think he had four pressures according to PFF. Um, you know, just, that's not a bad game. Um, Bryce Huff was definitely the guy under the microscope. It was fascinating that he played fewer snaps than uh, Brandon Graham, the ageless wonder, and um, and also Nolan Smith, one one fewer than Nolan Smith. But they all played about the same amount. Uh, I, I I think we got to like reserve any opinion on what this pass rush is going to be and what Bryce Huff, Huff is going to be. Um, Based on on what we see going forward here, and and week two is a great example of that. Uh, Kirk Cousins, uh, as we talked about before we came on this podcast today, is not the most mobile guy in the world right now. Uh, this is a chance for the for the pass rushers, uh, and, and you know you can put Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis in that mix too. Although there were some, you know, maybe the and this barely got any mention. The biggest play of that game. As great as Zach Baum has been, might have been come from Moro Ajomo, who had a pressure to force an incompletion there and and force the the Packers to kick a field goal on their their final actual drive that wasn't a desperation drive. Um, it was a huge play. So you know, pass rushes everybody. It's not just the edge guys, but. Um, you know, I think this is going to be an interesting week to see what what the pass rush can do. They're back home, they're on their own field. They got the advantage of fans being loud. They got the advantage of a quarterback who doesn't move great. Uh, let's see what they do this week. Now, I'm going to go back. I'll I'll, I'll I'll hit you with this one. And I look at that when you say like the, when you look at Bond and everybody. When you look at yeah, I mean it's Bond uh, Huff. Zach Bond seemed to be able to get attraction and get be able to get pressure 
Amaro was, why, why do you think it, it went on that field and slick? Why, why wasn't Huff able to do that? Yeah, that's a, it's, it's a it, it's a fair question. It's a very fair question. Uh, but you know, I I just think that there's there's plenty to Bryce Bryce Huff that we haven't seen yet. I thought he, I thought, and and if you guys go back and look at this, go back and look at the very uh, it's very late. It might even it, it might have even been that same last play uh, where Jamo got the pressure. It might have been a little bit before that, but Huff got a terrific rush. And I, I felt, I thought, uh, I know what it was. It was, it was on that last series that where the Packers were in desperation. Huff got a great rush and he got held. He got tackled uh, and they, and they didn't call it. Uh, now that's late in the game and they're, they are pinning their ears back. Um, uh, even if it's not, even if it wasn't to do with the turf, you can't, you can't judge a guy on, on, on one game. Uh, you know, you can't say, Oh, Bryce Huff is a bust based on one game. You, you say, Hey, let's see what we do. The interesting thing was the snaps. Uh, there, there were two interesting things about the snaps, in my opinion. Uh, one is that, and, and Vic Fangio, uh, alluded to it yesterday. Uh, you know, this isn't a retirement tour for Brandon Graham. He he still thinks he can play, and whatever's left in Brandon Graham, Vic Fangio is going to get out get it out of him this year. Uh, I thought that was very interesting, and it, and it's kind of telling. You know, a lot of the snaps that Bryce Huff wasn't playing were early down run snaps, uh, and th- that tells me that Vic Fangio doesn't think he's ready to be that guy yet. And it, you know his 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 blunt answer to well, what does he got to do to show you? It was basically he's got to you know stand out. He's got to stand out and be the guy who says you know, hey, I can't keep him off the field because he can stop the run. And in addition to that, he's my best pass rusher. Uh, obviously, Vic hasn't seen that from him yet. So r- regardless of the field, uh, which I still think was an issue for for both sides, uh, pass rush wise. Uh, the, the, the Packers didn't have really a great pass rush either in that game. Um, I, I, I think there were, you know, the the, the judgment, the, the grade for the, the edge rushers right now and Bryce, Bryce Huff is incomplete. Let's see more. Okay, cool. Caden, what are you thinking? What do you think about this pass rush? Do you think they'll round in a form against the Falcons? Yeah, I I, I think they will. Um, and Bob touched on a lot of good points do you think the field had a big impact on these pass rushers just from going back and watching the game? You could tell Bryce Huff um, on a few plays and even Josh Sweat and uh, it might have been even once for Nolan Smith, like these guys were losing traction uh, uh, when they were rushing. But, you know, at the same time, you know, the field can't be the only thing uh, as an excuse. I mean, they have to go out there and produce and they did it. And you you paid a guy, you know, 17 mil a year to be, a full-time player, so the Eagles are probably hoping and expecting that he becomes that. And if he doesn't, it wouldn't be a di- it would be it would be a disappointment. But like uh, Bob said, you know, after one week, it's hard to tell whether you know it's a good signing or a bad signing. It's really uh, tough to make a judgment right now. But I think he'll back bounce back against Atlanta. Um, one of the reasons why is uh, you know we look at this game against Green Bay. Yeah, the the field had an impact, but Green Bay's offensive line, I feel, you know, is an underrated unit. Uh, uh, I saw a stat uh, that, you know, Bryce Huff going against Zach Tom uh, on 10 pressures. He, I mean, against Zach Tom, against Zach Tom, he didn't get one. But at the same time, Zach Tom is one of the best right tackles in the league. He's uh, probably one of the more underrated players in this league. And uh, I think people underrate really how good this green by offensive line is. And you look at Atlanta, don't think it's as good. Uh, you got a guy like Caleb McGarry who was, you know, solid over the last two years after a rough start to his career. But uh, – just over across the offensive line, other than you know Chris Lindstrom and Jake Matthews, I don't really feel great about the Atlanta offensive line. I don't feel good about the quarterback being able to move. So there will be opportunities to get more pass rush in this game, in my opinion. And I think the Eagles will take advantage of a weaker offensive line and a mobile quarterback. You'll be at, they'll be at home. Um, so I think it will improve, but yeah, the, it is a concern though overall. You know, right now, just after one week, I mean. It's the easiest thing to point to because you traded Hassan Reddick this offseason. And look, it's not going good for the Jets because they can't agree to a deal with him. But you, you, you got rid of a guy who proved to be one of the best pass rushers in the league in that kind of that second tier. And right now, uh, you, you de- there's no guarantee that you have that guy that can take over games. And uh, 
maybe you hope that you see that against Atlanta. But I, I think they bounce back. Uh, Sweat, uh, uh, you mentioned Chris had a good game and had some pressures. I, I thought he was probably their best flash rusher as well and still believe that he can play at a pretty good level in this league. And I'm just having a hard time believing that, you know, Bryce Huff, who was a really efficient pass rusher in New York last year, I know he wasn't a full time player. Um, all of a sudden has, you know, lost that pass rush juice and isn't, isn't, able, isn't going to be able to, you know, make that type of impact. And in, uh, in Vic believes that Brandon Graham can still play at a high level and he can provide some pass rush juice. I think they can kind of piece this thing together and I think it will start showing uh, a little better against Atlanta. Nice. Now we're going to look at the second level of the defense now where there were some changes that were made with the starting linebackers, with Zach Bond and Kobe Dean becoming the starters. And that was, it appears to be like that happened even before Devin White was rolled out with a hand in, uh, sorry, an, excuse me, ankle injury that forced him not to travel with the team to Brazil. And when you look at this, it's going to be playing the role of a backup. You know, it was confirmed by Vic Vandrew on Wednesday. Both Bond and Dean played very well on Friday. Bond finished with 15 tackles, and two sacks, and Dean had four tackles, a, a tackle for loss. And he should have had a pick six, which I know the old adage, you know, defenders, that's why they're on defense because they catch. Well, he didn't help his cause in terms of that. I want to start with you, Caden, on this one. Do you think that the performance that that Bond and Dean is sustainable for over this course of the season, or do you think this was just a one-off performance? Yeah, this is a this is another tough one because you know coming into the game, um, I don't think any of us expected Zach Bond to get 15 tackles and two sacks. Like um, from my just from my perspective, you, know, uh, you bring in a guy that's never really been an inside backer before. I know Vic talked about it yesterday. He talked about it in training camp as well. I hit that you know there were times in on the Saints defense when he went inside and he saw a few of those plays and he felt you know, comfortable that maybe he could do it. But, like, even he talked about yesterday, like, he he wasn't going to necessarily, like, bet on it. And the fact that he came in and you you can make an argument on Friday, the two best players on the Eagles and the way they looked or, you know, or the three best, you know, or whatever. He was up there in the top three, Zach Bond, with Saquon Barkley and maybe Lane Johnson. And I just wouldn't have that, you know, all one of my predictions, you know, this year. But uh, he looked really good. I mean – Shedding blocks, uh, he was able uh, to diagnose stuff really well before the play even happened. He was all over the field, just 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 disrupting stuff at the line of scrimmage, and just his versatility, you know, as a pass rusher. Still, uh, being a former outside linebacker and an edge rusher in college, it, just lining up on the edge, he could do so much on this Eagles defense. And it's it's one performance, so it's tough to say whether Zach Bond can sustain this over a, a period of time. But, I mean, he's only really done it once for a full game, and he was incredible. So I can't say no, he can't. And so right now I'm going to lean that, like, yeah, it probably won't be 15 tackles and two sacks again because, I mean, that might be tough to sustain. But, like, quality above average linebacker play from Zach Bond it seems like a real possibility when I wasn't sure if it was going to be. Like, he was a question mark to me, and uh, – The question mark is not necessarily completely gone, but it's getting really, really close to being an answer. And then the Kobe. Yeah, uh, Chris, you mentioned he played really well as well. Maybe he didn't have the stats that Zach Bond did as well. And then maybe he gave up a few things here and there in coverage as well. But uh, just just the instincts that he played with, he blows up the screen on that one play to Emmanuel Wilson, the Packers running back. That was an incredible play. Just shows you just the anticipation uh, that he plays well if he drops the pick six, but it just seems like Nakobe for the most part is always in the right spots. And maybe he doesn't have the the size or the elite athleticism necessarily to be in like a guy that you uh, blankets you know people in coverage necessarily. But he plays with good in- anticipation, almost similar to like T.J. Edwards in a sense. Where I think he's a better athlete than T.J. Edwards, but like. I just think overall, yeah, this linebacker group can provide above average play this year. I, I just wouldn't be surprised. They're not going to be perfect. I, I do think coverage is still probably the biggest liability. But from everything I saw, they were super impressive. And that that really changes the, the defensive ceiling of this team. Uh, we talked about coming into the year, like uh, just linebackers has always been an issue other than the TJ Edwards and Kaiser white year for one year in 2022, it's, it's been a pretty consistent issue for the Eagles for a long time. So if they 
found their solutions at linebackers and the pass rush can get going and the secondary continues to play the way it did other than the few, you know, big plays they gave up. I mean, this defensive ceiling could be much higher because of guys like Zach Bond and Nicobe Dean. And I think it's tough to say it's a one-off performance for either. It looks like a positive thing going forward. And I think, I think they're going to play well. Hey, Bob, what do you think? What do you think about this linebacker core? Was it, was it Pirate Fool's Gold, or was it we have something in the making here uh, well, like I, a TJ I, Edwards? I do love this stat about Zach Bond. In 62 career games before Friday night, he had two sacks and 60 career tackles. Uh, he almost had a career in one night. It was definitely a career night, and it was almost his career, better than his career uh, in that one night. Uh, but it was it's impossible to as as Caden pointed out it's impossible not to be impressed by what he did he was all over the field maybe the 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 best play his best play of the night might have been um and one that didn't even show up on the stat sheet was when he dropped into coverage and and uh allowed Reed Blankenship to come up and and get an interception because the guy because he had the guy so well covered uh on the play that that might have been his best play all night and doesn't even show up on the stat sheet you know he had a missed tackle uh, that I can remember but for the most part he was just incredible and you no know, I didn't see it coming although uh, to the Eagles credit, you know, Sirianni and Fangio, um, you know, they all raved about him throughout training camp. And I've gone back to this story several times on podcasts now about how I talked to Dennis Allen uh, in, in at the owners meetings. And Dennis Allen was emphatic that, you know, this guy's an outside uh Edge edge guy, he doesn't belong as an as a middle linebacker, and he's you know, and basically basically said he's a he's a great special teamer. Uh, well, right now it looks like the Eagles have a lot more than that, and that he's definitely a guy who can play inside and and be versatile, as he pointed out that you know his his first sack came lining up on the outside. Um, you know, it's just a, a weapon that Vic Fangio will deploy as, as often as he can. And then the Kobe Dean, um, you know, he won that job. Let, let's face it. He won that job in training camp. I, I mean, I, I don't know if either of you guys remember Devin White flashing all that much. But Kobe flashes, you know, he might make mistakes here and there. He, he should have had that pick. But, you know, he blows up that that screen pass. Uh, you know, he hits guys with the kind of force that is momentum changing. Uh, you know, he, he's a playmaker. And, 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 and you're looking – you need more than anything playmakers at those linebacker spots because they that's where you can change a game defensively. Uh, and these two guys can do that. And that's, you know, that's what made Devin White great early in his career, uh, a Pro Bowl player, all pro. Uh, it doesn't seem to be there anymore. Now he's got an ankle injury to deal with. It's going to be fascinating to see what what's in store for him going forward. Uh, you know, especially when you also got like a guy like Jeremiah Trotter Jr. trying to get on the field and knock on the door. Um, I don't think uh, Devin White's future in Philadelphia is all, all that bright is the way I see things right now. You know, it's funny. I was talking to Bobby April the third. You know, if, if Bobby April, that name Bobby April sounds familiar. He used to be the former special teams coach for his Eagles back in, in, in years past, but I was talking to him. He was a, he was Zach Bond's linebackers coach back when Bond was playing in Wisconsin, and he used to say like this guy used to make these plays, and he pointed out that interception return he had, especially coverage. And I'm looking at his game, and I'm like, like, like I look back at more of his Wisconsin days, and I'm like, all right, you can see stuff there. I don't even know if it's translated. And I started watching the same like, I don't know if it translated. But I, I'm not ashamed to admit I was wrong about that. He definitely looked uh, He looked apart. I don't think he's going to be around the say, 15 tackle a game guy. I think he could be finished the season with maybe like 120 tackles. And we're talking about him as a potentially a Pro Bowl alternate or something like that. If he continue, if the defense and the key is going to be if the defensive tackles keep him clean. So that's his last, his last season. His last season in Wisconsin was was amazing. He had 19 and a half tackles for a loss and 12 and a half sacks that year, plus an interception that he returned for a touchdown. I mean, he he had an amazing last, and plus two forced fumbles. Uh, so it's there. The, the Saints. I'm not sure the Saints uh, got what they could have got out of him. So, Cool, cool. And now we're going to go to the offensive side of the ball. Saquon Barkley had 132 yards of scrimmage and three touchdowns in his Eagles debut, which three touchdowns hasn't been done since Terrell Owens made his debut back in 2004. 
But I'm going to ask you this one. When all is said and done, will he finish as the Offensive Player of the Year and win the award over Christian McCaffrey and or Tyreek Hill? True. That's a that's a that's a tough go. And we we discussed last week that the over under was 150 for in, 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 set by Chris Franklin and his brilliant script last week. You said that. <laughs> You set that number pretty good, though. That was a, Vegas might be interested in in, in using you. Uh, Trust me, the book has lost way more money than it actually has actually set this line. So yeah, I, I don't want to lose my job one day into it. Uh, but I, I took the over and it was slightly under, and that's why I, I would would say you know it, it'll be tough for Saquon to be the offensive player of the year because he's surrounded by so much talent. But uh, Christian McCaffrey, he, he won it last year, correct? I, I, I don't remember these things. I think McCaffrey won it last year, didn't he? Um, I believe he did. I'm looking up right now. I believe he did. I think he did. Or was that or Tyreek Hill, one of those guys? I got, I got to look up right now. But, but I, I, and both those teams have a ton of ton of offensive talent too. I mean, McCaffrey. He's gonna, Sorry. Yeah, he 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 could be in the conversation. He he will be in the conversation. I think. But the Eagles have so much talent around him uh, that I, I I'm not sure that he can win it. But I, I think he's definitely going to be in the conversation. I mean, does this look like a does this look like a spent fighter to you after you watch him for a week? He's not a I mean, he's still running hard. He's still he still makes the kind of cuts he made as a rookie. Um, you know, he still can run away from people. Uh this is this guy's a special talent and and we saw it in week one. So I you know, I wouldn't put it past him to to, to be in that conversation and be all season long. I mean, this is uh, I, you know how I feel. I've said many times I was I was an advocate for the Eagles getting this guy, and uh, week one I'm feeling pretty good about being an advocate for getting this guy. Nice, nice. Now dealing with another person that's on, that's on the offensive side of the ball, quarterback Jalen Hurts had two interceptions against the Packers, and this is coming after he finished last season with 15. And we know turnovers are always concerning. Caden, what do you contribute to the turnovers against the Packers? And do you think that we're going to see more of the same the rest of the season when it, in terms of Jalen Hurts turn, throwing the interceptions? Yeah, uh, I think the biggest thing that contributes um, to the turnovers, at least in that Packers game, from my mind, was just forcing some stuff. Um, the one that was the most egregious was the um, throwing across his body to A.J. Brown. Um, when you're in a position to score points there, uh, to take you know, a bigger lead to make it – uh, tougher on the Packers and you throw a ball there. Um, it felt like a little too much hero ball on that play. Like, that's a, it's a cardinal sin for, you know, quarterbacks to not make that throw. And look, you could argue maybe if AJ Brown doesn't really slip, he can come back and break it up and it's not a pick or uh, maybe he can make a play of it. But uh, that play was just probably not a risk that the Eagles, you know, or, or Jalen Hurts didn't need to take. And then earlier in the game uh, with the Devonte Smith throw, uh, he was covered by Quay Walker. Uh, he was picked up and wasn't really open and the ball was thrown late and probably another just error where he f- tried to force it and try to press it a little too much. Uh, and it is it is a concern last year because we uh, or this year because we saw him do some of this stuff last year where he just made some head scratching decisions and tried to force balls that weren't there and played a little too much hero ball last year. And um Look, coming into the year, I, I felt good about that, you know, being cleaned up because of how he played, you know, the summer. Like, look, the whole thing is everyone talked about him having only one interception the whole summer and he didn't throw it into the final practice and uh, he was clean with the football. But it might also show you that, you know, maybe training camp interceptions and stats are, you know, maybe they're overrated to some degree. But, uh, yeah, if these problems continue, I think it's going to be, uh, a big alarm because you, it's tough to win football games, you know, consistently when you're, you know, minus two in turnovers and you're, you're turning over the ball the way the, the Eagles did in that game. But look, the Eagles defense came up with a big stop in the red zone after that Devontae Smith pick. And then after the Cam Jurgens fumble as well. And uh, they came up with another stop on that drive to force them to a field goal after the AJ Brown pick. So the Eagles got away with it a little bit, but uh, it was, it was, I, th- I thought it was concerning overall. He played well against Green Bay. He did much better against the Blitz, and he made some really good plays on that last drive. So I got to give him credit where credit's due. I'm not saying Jalen Hurts played terrible or anything. I he he made some really good plays, but just the interceptions have to get cut down. When it comes to the rest of the season, though, I do think um, that it will be better. 
I, I mean, it, it turnovers are pro, tough to predict, but I think Kellen Moore and the Eagles, you know, with within this new offense, maybe Hurts just needs to settle down a little bit, and I expect him to do that. I expect him to be able to learn from that. He seems like a guy, and everyone always talks about it, that he learns from his mistakes, and if he has an area that he really struggles in or he's not the best at, he always works super hard on it. So I would like to believe that, you know, maybe he realizes it's this area where he needs to just – you know, cut out some of the turnovers and not take as many risky plays. So I, I do think it will get better, but if it doesn't, it's a big concern and it could it could lead to many problems. I mean, we've seen him at one point in 2022 where he was really good with decision-making and not throwing ter- interceptions and he was smart with the football and he was able to make those out-of-structure plays without, you know, putting the ball in harm's way. Uh, now I feel like when he tries to make some of those out-of-structure plays like he did with AJ, Drum- AJ Brown plays, uh, it, it it just feels a little forced at times. Now, I want to follow up with you on this one in terms of that, too. He's had Alex Tanney as his, his quarterback's coach last year, Brian Johnson the year before that, and now he has Doug Nussmeyer this year. We saw what happened when you had Johnson as his quarterback. You mentioned 2022. What do you think was right behind why he just had his precipitous cliff in a ways of protecting the ball through the air with that. I mean, you just, we saw, we know what he did 2022. He had the 15 last year and he had Alex Tanzi quarterback coach. You have a new system, a new quarterback coach that works directly with him, Doug Nussmeyer. Why is this cliff happened? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure, you know, why it's happening. I mean, 2022, even 2021, when he, you know, he played, he wasn't as good as 2022 overall. But like, I mean, the big thing about Jalen Hurts, uh, I mean, I never even in 2020 when he took over for Carson Wentz, the thing was that like Jalen Hurts is going to protect the football. I mean, that that was the narrative that he's going to play clean, smart football and he's he's not going to turn the ball over and he's going to make plays with his legs. Like, I mean, that's been the whole thing for the first three years of his career, at least. And we have seen this you know, switch with him. And it makes you wonder, does the different uh, changes of having three different offensive coordinators in three years and three different, you know, quarterbacks, coaches, and is there too many, like, you know, has he had too many people in his ear? Is it, is it too much information I want just in three years for him to kind of process and learn and be able to function, you know, uh, and make it and just play really well within just three different, styles and three different voices i mean it is tough i i think some of it is maybe last year uh just from my perspective watching those games especially in december that's when it really got bad we saw the play against seattle uh just overall the last month i just felt like he was just erratic and perhaps that was because the offense wasn't scoring many points and it just wasn't really functioning well overall as an offense the protection wasn't great uh uh, the the run game wasn't great. I mean, just nothing was really working at the end of last year. So I kind of chalked that up as him just feeling like he had to play hero ball for the offense to score points. But uh, this year, he doesn't have to do that with the weapons in place with uh, and better coaching, at least it seems, with Kellen Moore. So maybe some of this is just bad habits that he's picked up from uh, from last season. And just feeling like he had to press because his offense wasn't as successful under Brian Johnson last year. So. Uh, I I, th- I would say that's the, the main thing I'm guessing is that uh, this is uh, just bad habits that he's picked up um, from the struggles they had last year. And it's maybe it's carrying over into this year, but that's not a good thing because he doesn't need to play that way within the offense. When he was playing in structure, I thought he looked really, really, really promising. And just the way he was taking the throws, especially on that last drive, just hitting Devante, just being within structure. Uh was good, but he just doesn't need to play that type of hero ball to, for this offense to be good. You know, with all the different systems that he played in college, all the different offensive coordinators he had, and all the different offensive offensive amount coordinators he's had since he's been in the league here in the NFL, he pretty much feels like a human Rosetta Stone with everything else, with every system he's pretty much seen that. And it's crazy he's done it, but that's the reality that he finds. And it help happens when you win a lot, people still your coaches. Now we're going to go time for the run pass option. I'm going to ask these guys a statement. And I'll read it to them. If it's a statement that they like, they'll run with it and give a reason why. If it's a statement they think is not true, they'll pass it, and then they'll also give a reason why. We're going to focus on this week's upcoming coming against the Falcons, so we're going to start with Bob on this one. Bob, run or pass? 
The Eagles offense finished with 410 yards total offense against the Packers. They will finish with another 400 yard performance against the Falcons. I'm going to run with that. I'm going to make some points going back here. Uh, 410 yards. uh, I think we're going to see a lot of 400 yard games from the Eagles. We just talked about three turnovers and all this jail and hurt stuff. And the Eagles still scored 34 points, had 410 yards. I think uh, they're fourth and fourth and point or third and points tied for third and points, fourth and yards after one game. Uh, with those mistakes, they scored on six of their last nine drives uh, against the Packers defense that I think is better than the Falcons defense, although the Falcons defense is, is not bad. But I, I'm going to go on record right now saying the Eagles are going – I think the record for this 2014 Eagles, 29.8 points per game. This team will shatter that record. They will average more than 30 points a game, and they they will put up big yards – every week so i'm running with that uh and you know i I, I want to just like one more quick point about the interceptions there he could have thrown four and they were bad but i thought i thought cal moore made a good point yesterday especially on that first interception the eagles might have been too he might have been too aggressive in his play call there trying to pick up a first down obviously the first two plays of the season went very poorly, the, the, the first one being Saquon stumbling and put him in a second and 15 from their own five from right away. It probably should have been more conservative there. Now, ultimately, Jalen Hurts can make that decision, doesn't have to make that throw. But in some ways, it, it was kind of like a punt, you know, in terms of throwing the ball down the field because you weren't going to – you were going to be punting from the end zone if you didn't pick up any yards there. Uh, so, and, you know, and and – I thought it was a good sign that Cal Moore said, yeah, hey, you know what? I share some of the blame there. I think that's probably a good way to handle things with Jalen, too. Hey, we're all in this together. This isn't just you. Uh, ultimately, it comes down to quarterback. But anyway, I've, I've been long-winded here. Uh, yes, over the over the 410 yards against the Falcons, over 30 points per game almost every week this season. All right, cool. Caden, what do you think? Are you running with that or passing it? Yeah, I'll run with that as well. Um Atlanta's defense, um, I do think will be a little better than Green Bay's. Uh, the, the safety combination with Jesse Bates and Justin Simmons is a pretty impressive you know, duo. They got Matthew Judon on the edge. Uh, I like some of the linebackers and late Landman and Troy Anderson, Grady Jarrett. Uh, I, I th- they have a respectable defense, but at the same time, Bob made a good point. This offense has the potential to put up 400 yards. Almost every week, I, it's going to be tough for most defenses in this league to stop the Eagles or shut down the Eagles, except maybe for like the Niners and the Ravens and the teams that have really elite defenses. If you have a good to average defense, I think the Eagles can put up 400 yards on you, even if you're a solid overall unit. And the the biggest reason why is uh, just we we all wanted to know and we all – uh, we're curious and, you know, Bob was confident, you know, after Saquon signed about the impact that, you know, he would make on this offense and whether it would be a significant upgrade over DeAndre Swift and Miles Sands. And the answer is clearly yes. And the Eagles could have the best running offense in the NFL this year. Just the, just with the offensive line up front and the way they ran, they run blocked against Green Bay and they open up the holes for Saquon and, Look, he hasn't lost a step. I mean, that, I mean that was the the thing I was wondering with everything that he went through in New York with the injuries and uh, just the the six years of probably just for him to, just just tough times and just disappointment of not really living up to his potential because of a lot of circumstances that were around him. But I mean, he looked incredible uh, against Green Bay just as a runner and in on that touchdown in the passing game, we wondered, you know, how would he be used in that role? Obviously he's a weapon in that role as well. So they could have the best running game. Uh, Makai Becton looked really good run blocking. So this offensive line looks strong. Saquon looks strong and you still have AJ Brown and uh, Devontae Smith and AJ's ability to take over the top, you know, especially on that one touchdown on Jay Alexander and then Devontae Smith's, you know, role changing in the slot. I feel like it just makes them, you know, even more dangerous. You saw the two clutch, two uh, clutch catches on that final drive and just him making plays after the catch and Dallas Goddard and Jahan Dotson. I mean, they have so many different weapons and um, yeah, they did score 34 points after three, uh, you know, three turnovers. It did, I mean, may, who knows? Maybe they would have scored 40 for, for, or 48 or whatever it is. Like, I mean, this offense has the chance to be the best in the NFL. Uh, 
And the only thing that's getting in the way is themselves by the turnovers and the or afflicted, you know, just getting penalties. Uh, but other than that, not a lot of things can stop this offense, and I, I don't think Atlanta will be able to either. All right, cool. We're going to go rapid fire with some of these other ones here. Next one, Dallas Goddard will have more than five targets this week, and Jahan Dodson will finish with three catches. Gain, what do you think? Run or pass? Uh, I'll go pass. I, I Goddard, I, I feel it could get five targets. He, he had five targets last week. Last week he had four catches. Uh, I'm not sure if Do- Jahan Dotson's ready uh, to get a huge role in this offense. And we see Johnny Wilson get some snaps as a run blocker as well. And that kind of takes some snaps away from Dotson. I'll go pass with Dotson on three catches. But I, I think Goddard's possible. Bob, what do you think? Are you yeah, running or passing with that? I, I'm going past there too. I don't think uh, I don't think those two guys are going to c- combine. Uh, you're saying it's just five targets, but I don't think they're going to combine for for nearly ten targets between the two of them because there's just too many other weapons. So I'm going to go pass. All right, Bob, let's take it with you on this one. This is going to be an offensive line question. Matthew Judon and Grady Jarrett, both of the Falcons, will combine for two sacks this game. Run or pass? I'm going to vote both really, really, really good players. Uh, we saw Matthew Judon in that in that joint practice, but I'm going to pass on that too because I think the Eagles are going to protect do a better job of protecting uh, Hurts than would require those two sacks. I'm going to pass. All right, Kate, what do you think? Yeah, I'm going to go pass as well. I think Green Bay has a better defensive line than Atlanta, and the Eagles really gave up a sack. Uh, was really impressed the way Lane Johnson and Mylotta played on, on Friday, and just don't see a, a world where Matthew jo- Judon is able to really impact the game. All right, and next one we're going to go to the defensive side. B. John Robinson will crack the 100-yard y- r- rushing mark against the Eagles' defense and will have at least one touchdown. Cade, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to pass on that, uh, even though – you would think that Atlanta should use B. John Moore with the current state of Kirk Cousins. He only got 18 carries last week for 68 yards. And look, the Steelers defense is probably better than the Eagles overall against their own. But the Eagles didn't give up 100 to Josh Jacobs either. And uh, I don't see Atlanta giving the ball, you know, 20, 25 times to B. John, even though maybe they should because of, they have had a weird usage of them over the last two years, even though it's a new offensive scheme. So I'll go pass. And I don't think B. John's going to go for 100. Rob, what do you think? I'm also going to pass. Bijan had over 100 yards from scrimmage last week. He also had five catches for for 43 yards in addition to the 68 yards rushing. So he had 23 touches total, which is which is a good number. I think 20 is a good number for a back. But I don't think he gets the I don't think he gets the 100 yards rushing because I think the pack, the Falcons are going to be behind here and have to throw the football uh, more than they would like. Uh, so I'm going to go pass. All right, cool. Here's our final RPO question. I'll start with you, Bob. The Falcons will shock everyone and keep this game close, but win it. Uh, Pass, 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 pass. (laughs) Eagles are not losing in this game. All right, cool. Kate, what do you think? Yeah, that's a big pass for me. I I don't see that happening at all. All right, and real quick, what do you guys think your score prediction? What are your score predictions? Yeah, I'll I'll go I'll go twenty eight seventeen as my prediction. I'm going to go 35-20 Eagles. And I'm going to go 30-16. to 16. I think it's going to be one of those games where you're looking at it's going to be – well, I think we'll be writing in the third quarter. I'll have our stories almost written, but then Falcons make a late push and make it interesting. But, yeah, let's do that. Well – we're running because of the RPOs. We, we, we've worked on a lot of RPOs this week. We were going to skip the two-minute warning or the two-minute timeout if you're a college football fan, which I just don't understand why they just call two-minute warning. But the NCAA is, you know, insert bleep there. So we're going to head straight to the overtime question this week. And, Kate, I'm going to start to you with this. The NFL announced that Kendrick Lamar will be the halftime show performer at this year's Super Bowl in New Orleans. Now, I'm going to give you the keys to decide the halftime show for the following year's game, which is Super Bowl 60 at Levi Stadium in Santa Clara, which is home of the 49ers. You get to pick an act that has never headlined the Super Bowl, and you get to choose one surprise act because we all know how you got the main act and all of a sudden, hey, oh, my goodness, this person is performing with them. Oh, that's a moment, blah, 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 blah. They come out there, help sing their songs or do their own thing. Or do whatever, or do whatever you want for that. You can be as creative as you want for this. Who are you choosing as the op- the opening, the featured act, and who's the surprise act? Yeah, ah, uh, this this is tough. I get the, whew. <laughs> I, this this one may take me a second to think through, but I think for my surprise or as my feature act that has never um, headlined a Super Bowl. First of all, I love the the pick for Kendrick Lamar. What a great year, you know. He's had you know. 
pretty much ending Drake's career along with it. But glad that he's able to, to come out with a, a Super Bowl halftime performance. But if I had to go with a guy that's never done it before, uh, I, I think Jay Z would be my pick. He hasn't performed in the Super Bowl yet. Uh, I, I, he'd be a great headliner. Uh, I hate you right now. Oh, I hate that, you right now. I mean, he's oh. never, he's he's never done it. And we talk about all these rap artists currently. I mean, Jay Z in the two thousands. Crazy to me that he hasn't the way that he set the standard just in the industry and the fact that I still think he would bring in a huge crowd people would watch. Uh, I think he'd be I think he'd be amazing as a as a you know as a lead act and then the guy or uh, try, trying to think of like a surprise act hmm, who would drop in potentially I'm not sure I didn't have enough time necessarily to fact check this but. Uh, okay, so he has been brought up before, so this wouldn't be new, but I mean, and this would be controversial, so this might change the question, <laughs> but I would like to see Jay-Z and Kanye West together. I don't know if the NFL wants Kanye West because of, you know, so, some of the stuff that's happened in the last few years, but overall, it's a musical performance. I love when those two are on the same song, so I mean, I'll go with, the, I'll go with them, but I just don't know if that's actually happening. Well, if you bring out, you better hope the Kansas City Chiefs are not in that Super Bowl because if they have that and Taylor <laughs> Swift with Kanye is right there, you're just starting to think, I'll tell you why I hate you in a second or in terms of the Jay-Z thing. Not really hate, but I hate you just <laughs> when you, meant, you used that answer to that. Bob, who's your who's your uh, featured act and who's your surprise act that you're bringing out? All right, you ready? Yep. Teen drinking is very bad. I got a fake ID, though. Two, here comes the three to the four to the five. Now I'm looking at Shorty right in the eyes. <laughs> Are you ready? Jaquan, in my perfect world, Jaquan gets to come out, and we can have a very short halftime. He can come out and do his song, Tipsy, one of the greatest rap songs ever. Tipsy's just an incredible, incredible song. And then... Shabuzi comes out of the special guest and Jay Kong gets to pound him over the head over and over again for doing such a terrible job of a remake of an incredible song. And that's my Super Bowl halftime show. That's it. Peace out. I'm isolating that. I'm isolating that audio with you doing that. That might be one of the opening or closings for one of his next upcoming podcasts. That was funny. <laughs> oh. oh, I was not expecting that. Okay. <laughs> I was not. So now, <clears throat> Reason why I hate Kate, and this is my explanation that's coming up right now. Now, I, I, I thought about this. I'm sitting there. The sinister side of me wants to put Drake out there on the West Coast, but I know it's just going to be at, it's asking for trouble. You know, Kendrick Lamar, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm gonna. I was going to go with Jay Z. I think he he helped get other acts. I didn't think about that, but he'll be an ensemble, sort of like what we saw when they were in Inglewood to get the other acts that pop up there. He could be a bridge to the west and the east coast. Yeah, you know, have an ancillary side. Maybe he brings Wayne up with well, another. He's not happy right now right now because of the Kendrick pick, and a lot of people aren't happy with Jay Z. So I thought you know it'd be the bridge for the whole entire thing. Now this thing, the my surprise act, as an it's a, it's a nod to the history of West Coast hip hop. And I know some people liked it when it was used before. Some didn't as well, too. It was very controversial. But it's been 12 years since this happened. I want to see how it, it happened at Coachella. I'm bringing it back to Tupac Hologram, and I'm going to do California Love. You might as well. You're in Levi. Why not have that there? Everybody sees Tupac one last time. You know he's not in Cuba. No, he's not there. Whatever island you think he's. But it could be a nod to there as well, too. You have that, and you have Jay-Z. That'll be the showstopper. Then, eh, you go on from there on out. But... I'm not going to throw bars out there like Bob did. So we're going to end the show with that note. (laughs) So uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in once again to the No Huddle Show podcast. Shabuzi. What kind of name is Shabuzi? Oh, my gosh. Who knew you can get free entertainment in terms of the music world (laughs) in terms of that right here? (laughs) So make sure to check out all of our stuff on NJ.com slash Eagles. We're going to have all of our – all of us are going to be there to cover the Falcons game uh, Monday night, late night stuff. But we'll have stuff on NJ.com slash Eagles. And we hope you read it as well, too. And we'll give you all the news and analysis. So for Kate and Bob, I'm Chris. Oh, my goodness. We'll mercifully end it right now, everybody. Have a good one. See you.